Thank you. Madam Clerk, welcome back. It's good to see you sitting down there. Uh, as such, we will go ahead and get started on ordinances final read 5A, please. An ordinance amending Chattanooga City Code Part 2, Chapter 2, Article 5, Sections 2-581 through 2-586 relating to the Memorial Auditorium. All right, seeing no lights, be please. An ordinance here and after also known as the fiscal year 2018 through 2019 operations budget providing revenue for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2018 and ending June 30th, 2019 appropriating same to the payment of expenses of the municipal government, fixing the rate of taxation on all taxable property in the city, and the time taxes and privileges are due, how they shall be paid, when they shall become delinquent, providing for interest and penalty on delinquent taxes and privileges, Amending Chattanooga City Code, Part 2, Chapter 2, Sections 2-267, relative to paid leave for active duty training, and to amend Chattanooga City Code, Part 2, Chapter 31, Sections 31-36, through 36, 31-37, 31-41, and 31-43, Sections 31-322 and 31-354. All right, no lights, move on to C, please. An ordinance appropriating, authorizing, and allocating funds to the capital improvements budget for the fiscal year 2018 through 2019. Right. Let's move on to public works under D, please. An ordinance closing and abandoning a sewer easement located at 8615 Petty Road as detailed on the attached map subject to certain conditions. Well, we're good with that, Councilman. Let's move on. Uh, resolution 7A, please. A resolution approving short-term vacation rental application number 18STVR 00030 for property located at 563 South Crest Road. Councilwoman. Uh, moving so defer it a week. We're going to do that at six. Yeah, I just wanted to see five. if that was still the plan. I went up, yes. Okay. This don't work either. Alex, yeah, you have something to add, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Very but fine. the parties got together. The three people that submitted a letters against it sent us an email yesterday that they withdrew those letters and they had everything worked out with the property owner. So Did they were not planning on being here tonight. We were in the process of issuing the, the uh, certificate for it. Did, did those letters make it to Councilwoman Coonrod? Uh, I thought Charlie did. I'm sorry. I, I was Charlie Young got tied up in the outside. We we sent the letters, but they sent us an email that said, uh, "When when Charlie gets here, he can explain more." But if you would like me to do that, or we can forward those that email. Yeah, I think I think there's an issue with the attorney as well, not just those parties. Oh, okay. The attorney, okay. I'm sorry, I was just. Okay, well, I mean, with the letters being withdrawn. All right, thank you, Dallas. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Councilwoman. B, please. A resolution authorizing the use of Grass Buster Lawn Maintenance as primary vendor for abatement services and AB property preservation as secondary vendor for abatement services. All right, seeing no questions, C please. 
a resolution approving the acceptance of $298,536.53 from Hamilton County as proceeds from the 2018 real property bank tax sale with $291,204.30 sorry, $291,204 being applied as the city's portion $3,142.12 being applied to city attorney fees and $4,190.11 being applied to city treasurer costs. D, please. A resolution expressing the intent for the city of Chattanooga to issue bonds in the aggregate amount not to exceed 8.5 million of the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee for the purpose of paying all or a portion of the cost of the following. Greenway Farm Conference Center replacement, Third, Fourth Street, Alley Program, Cane Lane Greenway Connector, North Cane Lane Greenway Connector, South Complete Streets, on 26th Market to Wheeland, Goodwin Road, Segment 4, Patton Parkway, Shepherd Road Enhancement, Highway 153 to Airport and Sidewalks. E, please. A resolution adopting a five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2019 through 2023 subject to future revision, a copy of which is attached hereto and made a part hereof by reference. All right, F please. A resolution authorizing the award of a contract to MGT Consulting Group to conduct a legal analysis and disparity study and authorizing the city attorney to execute said contract for an amount not to exceed 175,000. Councilman Gilbert. We're gonna try to defer that um, a week, or uh, two weeks, I'm sorry, at right. six o'clock. Just have that motion at six o'clock, that'd be great. Um, all right, no further lights. G, please. A resolution authorizing the approval of change order number four for Jacob Engineering Group Incorporated relative to contract number W1000401 East Brainerd Sewer Basin Collection System and Pump Station Evaluation Upgrades. A consent decree project for an increased amount of $32,344 for the revised contract amount of $2,674,918.17. Council Mitchell. Mr. Chair, I could be mistaken about this, but I believe G, H, I, and J, uh, we went over in committee last week. Yes, sir, I believe you are correct. I believe all of these. We can skip over those, sir. G, H, I, and J, are there any questions on these items? They were covered last week in Public Works and Transportation. Well, we just give our clerk a refresher in, in reading all the items. No? Okay. Uh, in that case, those are all the items that we have on the agenda portion of our meeting this afternoon. So with that, we will move into Planning and Zoning Committee. Councilman Ledford. Good afternoon, anyone. Welcome to the Planning and Zoning Committee. Can I get approval for the minutes? Thank you. Very good. John, good afternoon, sir. Afternoon. Happy pre-4th of July. And we have some items to cover. Yes, we do. We have several cases. Um, you have the screen down, please. Kira, I'm not going to have you read them, so you're off the hook. <laughs> you're off the hook. Now, I'm going to assume I'll, I'll give a full presentation on these unless asked otherwise. And again, I try to keep that to about three minutes per case. 
Thank you. Be my goal. I hope I get there. Um, so this first case is 2018-106, uh, and it's a request to rezone attractive land from R1 residential to RTZ residential townhouse zone to accommodate a proposed five to six single family detached uh, development. And I'll show you the site plan right there. Uh, that was the original proposal. Um, it has, as I understand, it, it's changed, which I'll tell you in a minute how we got there. But it started off with five to six. Um, the property is located at um, five, I mean, 109 Guild Street, North Chattanooga. This is in Councilman Henderson's district. Uh, it's currently a single family detached dwelling on this property, as you can see in the aerial photo. Uh, if you look at the land use around it, it has single family to the north, east, and south, but to the west, there is some multifamily across the street from this property. And that, and then that property, to, you can see the apartment structures across the street um, are zoned R3 residential currently. Um, this site was part of a down zoning uh, that occurred in 1999 as a follow-up to an adopted plan that rezoned all this area to R1. Um, just give you some zoning history uh, of the site. Um, as, I get, as I indicated before, um, there are five, uh, there were at the time, five single-family residential detached dwellings proposed. Um, there are no steep slopes and there, or floodplain issues in this particular site. Um, the RTZ zone actually has a maximum density um, let me go to the, um, of actually only allows up to three lots as allowed by the RTZ zone. So actually what they're proposing would not be uh, approved or allowed in RTZ to begin with. Um, so staff um, and looking at the plan, which did recommend urban single family residential, which is about up to about 5,000 square foot lot sizes. Um, staff felt like a more appropriate density consistent with the plan as well as what the, the RTZ zone allows is three. So we recommended approval of the request with the condition that it be, um, I mean, let me check my notes here again, limited to um, no more than three residential lots. Get back to my, here we go. No more than sing, three single family lots, rear access only, uh, and single family detached dwellings only. That was staff's recommendation. At Planning Commission, there was no opposition. Um, after hearing from the applicant, the applicant actually opted that th they would go with the three for that particular property, so they concurred with staff's recommendation. So it comes with you with a recommendation from staff and Planning Commission to approve with the conditions I just noted. Very good. Councilman Henderson, do you have any questions, sir? Any questions from the council on this item? Oh, hello, Dr. Burris. Welcome. Very good. John, let's move. Okay. All right, uh, the next request is to rezone from R1 residential zone to R3 residential zone for multi-tenant homes. Um, this is a situation where um, the properties lost their legal non-conforming status due to power being turned off at the buildings. Um, this is located in Councilman Gilbert's district off of Old Mission Road. If you're familiar with the Brainerd Golf Course, this is just to the south of that. Um, the adjacent land uses you can see around the site are single family residential. There is an R3, R3 MD zone to the west of this property on the across Sequoia Drive. Um, but this area was also down zoned uh, to R1 as a follow to a planning pro effort back in 1995. Um, the closest R3 MD you see on the map here is across the street. And that was retained uh, when the re -study, rezoning study was done in 1999. Um, the site plan, um, basically all they're proposing to do is to reuse the buildings. This might be a good idea to actually show you the area. I'll show you the photos of the buildings. You can see there's a building on the corner, and, and there you can see both buildings together that they're trying to reoccupy those buildings. Um, so staff, in, in considering um, the recent rezoning study, uh, recommended to deny the request. Uh, however, there was no opposition at Planning Commission. And actually, the neighborhood submitted a letter of support for the request. So after hearing from staff's recommendation, the comments from the public and the applicant, they recommended to approve it, and that the use was consistent with the development form of the area. Um, they also requested us to do some additional um, exploration on the, the trigger for the 100 days vacancy, which we've already had a meeting with the LDO staff. We'll be getting back with, our, with, with Planning Commission on that. Um, I will note, just to make you all aware, that um, one of the items being discussed, which is real early, is maybe looking again at a special permit tool to avoid 
rezoning spot areas um, in, in uh, residential areas, but we're also cognizant of the fact that was gotten rid of. I see the look uh, uh, several years ago. So that's something that um, clearly will need to be discussed amongst council members before we do any additional work. I'm just giving you a heads up that that has been brought up by Planning Commission. Do we need to re look at bringing that tool back? So let y'all chew on that for a minute. But anyways, uh, Planning Commission's recommendation on this request is to approve. So you had a staff recommendation to deny and a, and a Planning Commission recommendation to approve. Thank you, John. I see you have a light for Councilman Gilbert, please. Yes. Um John is correct. The North Brainerd Council met and they decided to approve this. Um, they are recommending to approve it. Um, so that's what be that be my recommendation also. Um, John, you did say something about trigger. Yes. What, what is that hundred day trigger? What we'll, we'll just we'll currently discuss. this is again, this is based on city code. Um, if a property is not if it's vacant for 100 consecutive days, I'm looking at Don, make sure I'm we're seeing on the same page, uh, in Dallas, I see over there, uh, that it loses its legal non-conforming status. You know, some properties that are down zone, let's say, you know, we're operating as a duplex, but if they are not being occupied for a period or not being sought out to be occupied, because if you put it, if you advertise it, that doesn't count. But if, you, if you're just, if it's turned off, you're not making an effort to try to occupy the property, 100 days goes, you lose your legal non-conforming status. What That's about city code. what about I think I hope y'all are working on if some businesses um, predator lending business that have left the area on fifth day matter of fact is in Ken's district um, they didn't cut the electricity off but they have signs to sell the building mm -hmm. can we not have another trigger besides the electric power board to trigger a vacancy of a building so that the current Occupation will be something different coming in instead of having the same people coming in or same business coming in. I don't know if Dallas or Don, do y'all want to? The idea is if, if a property is vacant, even though the power's on. Donna, before you come up, I want to kind of reiterate real quick what we discussed at Planning Commission, and that is. The EPB power off trigger. It's not actually a trigger per se on paper. Is that correct, John? It's um, just a kind of a mechanism that is used to, to determine. The 100 days is the code. The means of by determining by how do you measure that? Measure it. Is, right. is a staff decision. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we don't, somebody may come up with a way, but um, at the moment, the only way we can definitively quantify when the 100 days begin. Uh, is with the uh, termination of electrical service because obviously it's assumed that if you were to be occupying a structure you would need electricity so we can't drive by or <coughs> see if cars are there whatever the case may be so um, the the discontinuation of electrical service is a definitive way to start counting the hundred days can this not be a complaint driven so if the community see a sign saying a for sale sign and it's been over 100 days can that not be a trigger also uh, the ordinance isn't written that way. If, I'm if, saying, if, there, if you all want to amend the ordinance and have some definitive way for us to uh, enforce the, whatever you come up with, we'd be happy to do that. Can we look at that? Um, that if if a sign, a for sale sign goes up, if a, if a community person sees it and triggers, tells our officials that, then it can start that clock, and that way. We have to look at a couple other factors to look at because they can still occupy the buildings even with the sign in there. But I understand what your request is, and and uh, we'll we'll talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, guys, for that sidebar. That was PC <laughs> Planning Commission. That, that's why I, I saw it in the slides. Okay, I guess I need to talk about that. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, and the root of that, John, uh, just to follow up real quick. Yes. Um, is that uh, there are a lot of renovations going on properties, Same and properties are losing their renovated during that time in construction yep. you just sometimes things happen and you have to go through the process again and it's just we're seeing it more often gotcha thank you um the next case is hold on I've got, yeah i've got some lights oh, hang on sorry. one second oh. is that you councilman mitchell because it says it says erskine but i think it's you Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a question. Yes, on sir. The previous conversation with Councilman Gilbert. If we chose to go down the road of creating a through an amendment a mechanism to do things to commercial property, like we have the mechanism on residential, would that move? have to go through planning commission first or could we act independently of planning commission to do that i think it's in 38 is it not i think this language is in 38 it's a zoning or so you have to get the pc okay thank you thank you dr birds did you have your light on just some clarification go back to this particular you got the image of the, of the, of the yeah buildings? the image okay so was this something that was in the da down zone area so it's now all r1 yes correct and i see a door on the side here was it being used inappropriately how how was what was the use as i understand it at the time of rezoning it was being used as apartments and then over time it got the power got turned off and so that triggered the loss of their legal non-conforming status. All right. So let's say it is, it's lost its grandfathering ability. Then we get to spot zoning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a dangerous road. I'm going to support my colleague, mm -hmm. but I think we're, we're setting a precedent. And I, that's are where you going to allow spot, spot zoning somebody just to come in and it's so I mean, within your legal discretion as i understand as a council as long as there's the you know you're talking about the basis for for why you're doing making that choice i mean um you could argue if you look at this slide of zoning there is r3 md across the street so you could say this corner because there's already r3 md across the street and we're essentially acknowledging that there is a zone across the street at this intersection that's R3 MD. This is consistent with that zone across the street. You can make an that's argument that's grandparented not. in or I mean, it's, just, it's a zone. It's there. I mean, I'm not talking about use now. I'm talking about the zone. You already got R3 MD across the street. Um, so you're creating a similar zone in close proximity to that R3 MD. So in that sense, it's so you're letting it to con you're letting it continue to do it's not going to lose its its purpose. I think well, to your point, you want you want to note is for the record that the intention is that it would stay at this intersection. That we, this is not implying that the whole neighborhood can go R three. Well, yeah, because I think there may be some pushback from that. It's yeah. not my district, but you start eating away, and Councilman sure. Gilbert and I, for a while, had to fight that with duplexes. And I just want to make sure that we're not allowing neighborhoods to go down in any way gotcha okay very good any other comments questions on this item very good all right john okay the next request is to rezone from r1 to r3 you see a pattern here uh, <laughs> uh, on randolph circle this is also in councilman gilbert's district um to uh accommodate a a basically uh an existing um vacant uh multi-family residential building uh, let me make sure I get this right. I'm not on the right case number. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, to convert it to apartments. Um, to the north are single family residential and industrial. Let me look at this. If you can see that the uses, you can see there's some industrial buildings to the north. You look at the zones. You also got M1 to the north. Um, you got R1 to the south, R3 to the uh, west, and you got some C2 back on the east. So there's a mix of zones in this area. Uh, the the Highway 58 plan, let me go into that, recommends business and technology. So it's kind of anticipating that this area is going to intensify over time and support a policy for, you know, more intensive uses such as commercial at this location. Um, so based on the existing zoning pattern and the recommendations of the uh, area plan, staff recommended to approve it. Um, and again, we see that R3 as a transition between those more intense and in, uh, commercial and industrial uses and the R1 to the south. Uh, so staff was comfortable uh, with approving on that basis. At Planning Commission, there was no opposition. Uh, so Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation to approve. Thank you, John. I do have one light. Councilman Gilbert, please. To add what John said, I did speak with the neighbors next door 
uh, one of the gentlemen that have been down here a couple of times about other issues. And he said it was for it. He said people surrounded was for it because uh, it was so overgrowth, it was deteriorating. He felt like that it would be a best practice to put something like that in. So that's why I said I agree with it. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Any other comments, questions on that's this item? Right there. Okay, moving on to D, please. Okay. This is also, uh, I think this is in Councilman Gilbert's district. All right, or Burr's district. This is in Burr's. Dr. Burr's. Burr's district, okay. Um, this is a request to rezone a piece of property from um, R1 residential to M1 manufacturing zone to accommodate the expansion of an existing industrial property. If you look to the, to the, to the south and southwest, there are some industrial properties and they're wanting to, to do basically add additional land for expansion. Uh, it's, the site is currently vacant and wooded. Um, the airport's kind of off to your left um, from the screen. Um, there has been no recent zoning history on this site. Um, you do see you have some commercial zoning across the street to the east. Um, it should be noted though that the plan, here, again, here's the site plan. The site plan shows Really, this is something that staff keyed on is that they're really not proposing to use all the property at this time. The site plan indicates you can see the building uh, being constructed on the southern edge of the property with some parking and one access drive uh, coming out to Vance Road. But you can see the remaining tracks across a creek are basically not proposed for development at this time. So um, the plan also recommended that was adopted for this area the Shepherd Community Land Use Plan recommends this to be low density residential. And probably the thought at the time was to try to maintain some kind of buffer or transition between those more intense commercial uses and the residential uh, to the north. So staff in reviewing it recommended basically to approve rezoning just a portion of the property that is based on their current development proposal. So we recommended to deny rezoning the entire site but to only approve rezoning a portion, which you see outlined here in the dash circle, uh, dash line on your screen. Um, that way you maintain that buffer transition to the residential properties to the north, but allow uh, you know, some potential future growth of manufacturing, which is an extension of the M1 zone to the south. So um, there was no opposition at Planning Commission to this request. Um, so Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation uh, to approve rezoning a portion of the site. Thank you, John. I do have a light. Dr. Burst, please. Yes, um, I've not spoken with the people at all to see what their long range plan is. So um, the question I have is how does that fall in with the airport overlay and all the plans that- This is outside that. It's immediately outside. Yes, uh, pretty good way, because if you, if you zoom out, let's go back to the aerial here. That probably doesn't give you good enough it's at least, and I'm giving you a, I want to say at least when one to 2,000 feet away. When you away. cross Lee Highway, when Vance Road, coming from East Brainerd Road, crosses Lee Highway. Right. And then the next stop is Shepherd. Is, to the uh, north. Yeah. Where is this located exactly? It's halfway in between those two points. So you can see, actually, you can see, if you look at the very top of that screen, where it it ties into the airport connector road. If you see it kind of curves to, yeah. to your left, yeah. that's where it ties back into airport road, the connector road. Okay, well, I've not seen anything on it, so I will be moving to defer. Okay. Okay, and hopefully uh, the people will contact and have some idea, because there's, there's people living in there too, and yes. we're trying to clean up the whole area. So to take part of it and make it go to M1, I'm still trying to figure that one out. So okay. I will be moving to do that till we figure out what, what's happening there. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions, comments on this item? Okay, John, E, please. All right. Um, this is a request to lift conditions. It's also in Councilwoman Burr's district. As, John, as that's, this is on here incorrectly. It was supposed to be moved for 30 days. Okay, which so was back in June. Right? Um, she hasn't even had 30 days. It was the second week okay. in June. She contacted me. She was supposed to get plans to okay. us. That's never happened, but I believe she thinks she has at least another week. 
All right. I think the record said defer for 30 days. I thought it would put us here, but maybe not. I, I, okay, we'll, we'll, I'll follow up with her. Um, I'll send week's. her an email and copy. This is next, next week's. week's. Yeah. That would be one month. Yeah, 30 days. So, so, so he, the only reason I'm saying anything is she thinks 30 days. I'm pretty sure I deferred it for 30 days, which would be next week, which would give her another week to get something in. She hadn't done anything. Okay. And then I, I would move to deny, but right now she does have another week. I'll remind her, I'll, I'll shoot her an email to, to get, if, if, if for account sake action, to get y'all something to look at, if there's any additional clarification she can provide. She knows what she's supposed to have. She's okay. supposed to have a rendering. We had a long discussion about it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a request. This is in the uh, south side area. This is in Councilman Ogilvie's district. Oglesby's district, a request to rezone from UCIV 6 to UCX 4. This uh, CIV stands for basically civic use. At the time, this was owned by the um, historic, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, our historic cornerstones. cornerstones thank you. Cornerstone. Um, and so it was, it was kind of a semi public building at the time. That's why it was zoned CIV. Uh, they since, as I understand, it, sold it to a developer to build a, a restaurant brewery and restaurant on the site and to do that you would need a CX zone so again the intention is to retain the building but just change the use to a brewery and restaurant to do that they need the CX zone to accommodate that um, this is located you can see right next to the UTC stadium um, it's currently uh, the, the building is currently vacant <coughs> uh, you got a public market the Chattanooga market uh, to the south and east of this structure um, you got also got a city skate park and a dog park um, to the north, you've got some industry, industrial use. Uh, if you look at the zoning map, you can see it's surrounded by, um, it's got CX-4 on the, on the northeast side, uh, IX to the north, and it's surrounded by a CIV zone. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the downtown plan, um, let me look at that, uh, da, 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 recommends a mix of uses and particularly reoccupying historic buildings. This does that by encouraging some kind of a program restaurant use that accommodates reuse of the building so staff based on that it supports the rezone to the uh, cx4 um and since the form based code has a whole set of standards that go with it there's no need for conditions so staff was recommending to approve the request um there was no opposition at planning commission um planning commission concurred with staff's recommendation to approve very good thank you john councilman oglesby do you have anything no, no, I'm very like familiar with that? it, and I've talked to the, the owners of this property, and it falls within what John mentioned, so oh, I'm good. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I believe I do have one. Is that you, Council, uh, Chairman Smith? Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's Jerry Mitchell, but I, I know who you are. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, John. Um, I saw, I've, and I've been by the building, and it looks like it's under renovation and everything. Are there are there any conditions that prevent once this change is is put into place for any reason, just demolishing the old building? I know it's encouraged to keep it, but is there anything to prevent it at this point? I I'll con confirm. I believe as part of the sale, it had they had to. I'll confirm that as a matter of record. I thought there's a deed restriction that requires them to retain the existing building. But That's kind of what I was thinking as well. So I was just curious if that was known and part of this just to be sure i'll confirm for the record okay i'd appreciate it thank you councilman yeah, uh yeah in answer to your question councilman smith that was the condition of the sale is that they uh maintain the integrity of the the building so there you go all right any other comments questions on this item if not g please Okay, um, this is located in, further down along the Rossville Boulevard area um, on the 3900 block of Calhoun Avenue, also in Councilman Oglesby's district. Um, this is a request to rezone from R2 residential to C2 convenience commercial zone for a proposed tire sales store. Um, the uh, property is currently a, a vacant parking lot. There are no structures on the building, I mean on the site. Um, to the north, you have commercial office and warehouse, but it is, as you can see on this map here, on a re, uh, residential block, we have some residential buildings to the south and uh, to the west across from the property. Um, the uh, zoning you can see currently is R2 for most of this block. Um, the land use plan basically recommends this eventually turn commercial. 
uh, for the, the Rossville Boulevard uh, community plan. Uh, and that's probably due to the fact that the most, if you, again, if you look out, it's to the north, south, east, and west surrounded by commercial property. So it's, it's, it's anticipating this is going to, uh, or, or supporting the eventual commercialization of this block. However, you still have some existing residential structures on this block. So staff, in looking at this request, recommend approval with some conditions to ensure that we're not impacting the existing homes that are to the south. And one of those is, I go to the site plan, um, that there would be no entry or exit onto Calhoun, since that's more of a residential street. They, they would be encouraged to access either the rear alley, because there's a rear alley servicing this property, or 39th Street. Uh, 39th Street's already got some commercial buildings on it, and it kind of has a commercial character. Calhoun is still a residential street. So when reviewing the request, staff recommend to approve subject to limiting access from either the rear alley or East 39th Street with no access on Calhoun Avenue, uh, no dumpster pickup between the hours of 8 and 5, and the hours of operation for the building between 8 and 6. So this is something similar we do, again, where you've got a commercial type development in close proximity to residential. We try to limit hours of operation, control access, uh, and that, that kind of thing. Um, there was some opposition at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, there's a resident who had concerns about the safety of the area. Um, there had been some drug activity, particularly on this lot, and they just want to be sure that that was going to be cleaned up as part of the redevelopment of this property. Um, after hearing from the public and the applicant, um, Planning Commission uh, supported staff's recommendation to approve with these conditions. Councilman Oglesby, you have anything on this one? No, no, very familiar with it, and uh, everything has been worked out. Thank you for your efforts. It's not a high-end grocery store, is it? <laughs> Sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, H, please, John. Tell us getting close to this. Uh, this, is, this is a request that was deferred by council about a month ago. Um, this is a proposal to rezone a, tr a portion of a block in the Highland Park neighborhood near the intersection of Hawthorne and Union uh, to support basically uh, some apartment uh, units, uh, 19 units. Um, it's currently zoned R4 with conditions, so there are some conditions that already restrict the use of the property but would allow apartments. Um, the reason they're requesting the UGC is to allow more of an urban layout, which puts the building closer to the street with parking to the rear, as opposed to having parking in front. Um, we did get a revised site plan. My understanding is that the applicant, c &E, did meet with the neighborhood, and they modified their design, as you see here. Uh, the, the, the big concern with the community was, it, at the original proposal, it was all one building, so it kind of felt more like a commercial intensive building across from the single family to the, you know, which is to the south of this property. The design, as you can see here, broke the building up really into four buildings where you have one primary structure fronting, uh, let me get my street names right. What is that there? Hawthorne, thank you, Hawthorne. Um, so you still have one big building fronting Hawthorne, but along, um, is that Union Street, is that right? Um, you have three separate buildings with, as I understand, there will be porches out facing the street. That was one of the primary concerns of the residents. But I know the applicant will be here next week to explain in more detail uh, what this site plan means. Um, staff maintains their position uh, to recommend approval subject to, um, let's see here, subject to uh, some limits because UGC does have uses that are not appropriate at this location, so there'll be no auto-oriented uses or self-storage facilities, uh, no commercial uses permitted to front union, and garages where present would shall directly enter from alleys and shared driveways rather than the public street. So those, those are the conditions that were recommended by staff. Um, Planning Commission had the same recommendation as staff. Thank you, John. Councilwoman Coonrod, do you have any questions or comments on this item? All right, thank you, ma'am. All right, moving into resolutions. E, please. Okay, this is, um, we're doing some cleanup here. This is for a PUD that was approved by council back in April, I believe. Um, we had approved a, a site, a PUD with a site plan, as you see pictured above, um, the, where it was noted there would be 150 lots, but the actual lots, when you count them on the site plan, do not add up to 150. And by the letter of the law, what you approve on the site plan is what LDO enforces when it gets to the permitting side of things. 
And so what we wanted to do was to be sure to correct the site plan to reflect the actual number of lots that were shown as part of actually the staff report and was labeled on the plan. So this is the revised site plan. As you can see, not a whole substantial amount of difference. It's the same number of units. Um, they did move the townhouses. You can see before the dark structures, the townhouses were kind of more in the middle. Um, this, in this particular diagram, it moves them down to the cul-de-sac to the south. Uh, but the, the units do not change. It's still 150 units. Very good. This is uh, this one is in my district, and I'm familiar with the revision of the site plan. So I have no further questions. Any other comments on this item? I do. It would be Councilman Mitchell slash Oglesby Jr. <laughs> Been called much worse. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chris. <laughs> Okay, um, Mr. Turney, this is something for you. Obviously, we've we've this this developer is having some problems in a different part of town. Uh, I believe in Councilman Henderson's district. Um, what are our what is our legal ability to do something? I'll just say it the way I'm thinking it, to prevent them from doing anything else until they fix it. I mean, he's been having, this problem's been going on for a while now and there's been promises of fix and what's our ability to block anything else until it is fixed? You know, I think I think it's a bit of a challenge legally. I don't I don't see what what basis you would have for for blocking it at this time. I, I do I do know, and maybe Councilman Anderson, not to put you on the spot, but this might be an opportunity to tell about what what work is being done on with with this particular developer on the issue that you're you're dealing with. Well, the, the most immediate concern is development they have going on off of Mountain Creek Road on Daylily Trail where uh, the development is uh, basically washing out into the road. Uh, stormwater issues uh, that we're having uh, that we don't seem to be able to get resolved continues to happen over and over. I mean, that's the issue that we're having immediately. Well, now, in a broader perspective, we are putting together a committee about a proposed development uh, that's, that is planned for the Mountain Creek Road area as well. Is that, is that what, what, which issue are you actually referring to, Councilman? The, the issue you, you, you described, I mean. We, the stormwater issue? Yes. Okay. And, right. and we have violation after violation after violation after violation after violation after violation. And they just I, keep I, I, marching forward, right. doing developments. I better understand that. I thought you were re referring to the second item that he raised. Uh, let me think about that in terms of whether there is some other basis here. But I can't think of one off the top of my head. But uh, let me think about it. Okay. I get with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that concern. Any other comments or questions on this item? Very good. Moving ahead. Okay, this is the um, last resolution. Um, this is the, um, well, as far as they're from planning commission, they get another liquor store permit as part of your list. But uh, the uh, this is a request for a PUD in the Brainerd area, the 100 block of Sunnyside Drive. Um, they're wanting to create a plan unit development to accommodate, I believe it, let me look at the number of units here. It's not on my notes. 14 units, is that right? 14 units, um, 14 units, 14 residential units um, with a community area. You see that dash line in the back. That's something we're still working with the applicant on. And I'll comment on that in a minute. Um, but that's what's being proposed. Uh, if you look at the zoning of the area, um, it's R1. There is some R3, a little, uh, not, not too far away, 
uh, to the east, to the west, um, but it accesses off of um, Sunnyside Drive and Inglenook Drive. Now, Inglenook Drive is a very narrow road, um, and so that's partly what informed the subdivision design. Most of the units will be accessed off of Sunnyside Drive, not Inglenook Drive. There's only one property. If you look at the site plan here, uh, lot 14 will actually be accessing off of Inglenook Drive, which is really a, a narrow lane um, uh, that uh, accesses this part of the, of the development. Um, so in reviewing the request, the actual density what's proposed is not much different than R1. It just basically allows them to have some smaller lot widths uh, to get the lots onto Sunnyside Drive. Um, so, um, but there are steep slopes, as you can see here on this site plan, that the uh, property drops off pretty significantly toward um, Inglenook Drive um, to the east. So um, that's partly why you see the community area being designated for that section because it's pretty steep and pretty much hard to develop anyway. Um, uh, so uh, let's see here. So staff comments. Um, again, uh, we think it's generally compatible with the density of the, look of the area. Uh, you've already have a mix of residential development that's found adjacent to and near this site. So we recommend approval. Um, we did have some comments on the um, community lot, uh, and, I, and I believe the applicant can probably address this. I'm just going to go to the site plan. Um, the, what the applicant would like to do is, I understand it, and tell me if I'm mistaken, is to have this done by deed restriction as opposed to a community, as opposed to a actual separate lot, uh, so that not have to create an HOA, uh, which there are some costs associated with, with forming an HOA. However, I'm not sure the PUD lets you do that, and I've asked my staff to look into that, if that's something that a PUD will actually let you do a community area by deed restriction as opposed to a actual, t some kind of ownership arrangement where there's common ownership in the community lot. Um, so I've asked my staff to look into that, and we'll have some more information for you as a council next week. Um, but there, what the applicant was requesting to do is basically would do this by deed restriction, and it would not be a separate parcel of land. Good. But, but anyway, I meant to tell you, it, there was some, I should get into opposition and please see review. Um, there was oppo some opposition at the meeting. I think mainly had to do with follow-up questions to be sure there was some clarity about how the, the community lot would be accessed and making sure there was not a, a lot of development coming off of that steep property to the, to the east. I think after those questions were dealt with, um, Planning Commission actually added, I believe, or uh, are noted, I think that the idea is, is it's important that there be some kind of community lot access or, or residential access onto those properties. So actually, and let me look at the actual resolution. I'm not, I don't think that's right. I think right. street lights were also in there. Yeah, let me look, let me read the resolution. I think that slide is actually wrong, it's written. Give me a quick second. I'll read it right as it's written here. Yeah, it's, there should be, that is the wrong slide. Maybe that's why, I, okay, he just entered it, he just copied it wrong. I'm gonna read it for you. Um, the conditions are, one, add a sidewalk and street lights as to be determined along Sunnyside Drive. Two, community lot 15 to be a separate standalone lot, so that's something we'll have to talk about next week. And three, that pedestrian access easement to be provided from Sunnyside Drive to the community lot. So those are the three conditions. Um, and I'll have, I'll give, at least I'll have a response on the community lot question for by next week's meeting. Very good. I do have one light. Councilman Gilbert, please. And the applicant did have a meeting with community and with neighborhoods surrounding this property. Um, possibly about 45 people was there and my understanding was just two, I was there too, just two people who actually complained. Didn't have a, they said they won't see trees, that's basically what they were saying. So um, everybody there mostly said they want this to happen. Um, Chris, uh, the conditions, are y'all working that condition part out? Uh, yes, Councilman Chris Anderson, Green Tech Homes, Rocky Chambers with Chattanooga Engineering Group. I have a new document that shows the trail access easement that I'll hand to Councilman Oglesby if he'll pass down. There's even a copy in there for Wade so he doesn't feel left out. 
That's all about you. Uh, so this will show the trail access easement as a part of that condition. And as John said earlier, we're still working on how we configure that community lot. I know you and I in, in previous discussions had talked about us actually giving that land to the city of Chattanooga. Uh, if you wish to, to take that on, we would, we would just deed that over to the city, uh, but whatever you feel is appropriate. We are trying to avoid an HOA on this property, though. Okay. We'll talk more about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Councilman, are you good? Yes. Very good. Any other questions, comments on this item? Seeing none. Um, John, the last, last item one is, is it's just a renewal of a liquor yeah. store permit. And just to give you some background, as you know, there are some distance requirements for stores, but just to, uh, this is at 4400 Russell Boulevard. It's renewing an existing, it's already been per permitted in the past. I think there's a change of ownership which requires a renewal. Uh, I did just do a quick check to see if there's any churches or schools nearby. Uh, here's the property on Russell Boulevard. Um, here you can see the churches. Uh, if you look at the bar on the lower left hand side of the screen, it, it shows you what's a thousand feet. So clearly, at least by what's, in, what's registered with Google, there are no churches nearby. Um, did the same thing for uh, daycares. Uh, the closest thing you got is the Cedar Hill Head Start. Uh, you see to the lower left hand corner, but again, that's more than 500 feet away from the liquor store. And then um, schools, again, you can see it's quite a distance from East Lake Academy and East Lake Elementary School. So I, I'm not aware of any buffer issues for this property and schools, daycares, or churches. Is it close to District 1? I don't know. I'll okay. let them answer that. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments for Planning and Zoning Committee? If not, do that's all we have for today, Chairman. We are adjourned till 5, 5, 5 p.m. Adjourned till 5.